For a monk of Rivo Abbey, life was simple, quiet and isolated. They spent their days in prayer, reading and working. The monks were known as Cistercians, a Benedictine order that began at Clairvaux Abbey in France, which is how the story of Rivo Abbey begins. In 1132, 12 monks from Clairvaux Abbey founded Rivo as the very first Cistercian monastery in the north of England. In the late 1130s, the first abbot William constructed some stone buildings around the present cloister. Parts of the west and south ranges that he built still survive, but a lot of what you see today was built by Rivo's most famous and loved abbot, Aelred. Historian and University of Leeds professor Julia Barrow told me more about Aelred. Aelred was um, the third abbot of Rivo, so he's not one of the founding figures in the abbey. He was born probably about 1110. He uh, found a position for himself at the court of King David of Scotland, probably when he was still quite young um, in his teens. David sent him as a, a messenger and envoy to um, various people. And it was on one of these trips that um, Elred made the connection with Rivo, who was visiting the Archbishop of York. He was a talented figure with a wide range of contacts, but he's also uh, very good at speaking, preaching and writing. Aelred is known for his surviving writings on the lives of saints, histories, guides to the monastic life, and in particular, friendship. He praised friendship, uh, particularly in the way he presents it, he's um, talking about friendship within a monastery. In the book on spiritual friendship, Aelred presents little vignettes of himself talking to younger monks, um, evidently at Rivo, and one of them clearly was Walter Daniel, who became um, his biographer. So it's a very intense sort of um, set of relationships, and Elred praises friendship. I mean, it is um, a highly moral take on friendship, uh, but nonetheless, um, he is praising sort of close, quite intimate relations between people and valuing them for the emotional support that you get from them. Some historians have theorised that Aylred may have been homosexual, based off the topics of his writings, as well as the impact that he had on the monks at Rivo. Monks who had struggled to settle at other monasteries found in Aylred a loving and compassionate father, the monks held their abbot in such esteem that they called him our Aelred. Um, I think it's perfectly possible that Aelred, uh, if he'd lived nowadays, um, would have been um, defined as homosexual. Uh, but another problem with putting the question like that is that people in the 12th century didn't tend to define themselves by their sexuality. I don't mean that they didn't have sexualities, clearly they had a lot of them, but um, they're not defining them themselves in, in the way that we would define ourselves nowadays. The world today hasn't moved on as much as you might have thought when it comes to views on homosexuality, with it still being illegal in 72 countries and punishable by death in 11. Homosexuality was not taken lightly in medieval times either, of course, and punishments for relationships amongst monks were severe. The usual punishments for uh, monks consisted of flogging and if you repeated an offence uh, frequently you would possibly be locked up but um, probably flogging which would be done um, in the daily chapter meeting and would be done in public in front of the whole community. After Aelred's death in 1167, the abbey went through a huge rebuilding phase. The two distinct types of stone that you see today either come from this rebuilding period or from the 1100s. I spoke to buildings archaeologist Anna Hughes about this project. We get to around the 1220s in Rivo's history um, and we see a massive shift. Um, first of all, in building styles. By this point, 
Gothic has arrived in not just England, but in Yorkshire. The other factor that we find at Revo is that Revo under Eldred's leadership has actually also become extremely wealthy, um, which means that the Abbey has money to spend. The other thing that we have because Revo has become very rich, the community has expanded massively. By the late 13th century, early 14th century, the monastic community is about 650 strong and 150 of those are the choir monks compared to the lay brothers. So all of a sudden they need a lot more space in order to accommodate those choir monks. So they decide to rebuild the eastern arm of the abbey in this Gothic style, which is much more elaborate than the original style. Um, Eldred's shrine would have been at the centre of the worship by this point. Uh, people would have come on pilgrimage to visit Eldred's tomb and hope that he would be able to grant miracles. What was supposed to be a period of growth and prosperity turned sour when the Abbey's finances crumbled under immense debts. Obviously this rebuilding of the eastern end of the Abbey really shows how prosperous the monks at Revo were by this point. They were extremely wealthy, they were involved in industry, they had a huge flock of sheep. This all starts to change towards the end of the 13th century. Um, they are having to compete with other orders, particularly within the cities, the Franciscans. They also have this massive flock of sheep which is decimated in 1276 and this really changes the financial uh, kind of fortunes of the Abbey. And in 1279 the Abbey had to have actually declare bankruptcy and Edward III's actually installed a financial executor who took over the Abbey's finances. We have more problems in the 14th century. In the early 14th century, there is um, a battle not far away from Revo, the Battle of Old Byland, which was fought between the Scots and the English. And the Scots actually raid the Abbey. They win the battle and they raid the Abbey and they take a lot of the riches. The 1340s, 50s and 60s, you've got the Black Death, which ravages Northern England. And by the late 14th century, there are actually very few monks left. The buildings that used to house the lay brothers were demolished and the community shrunk to 14 monks, three lay brothers and the abbot. And things weren't about to get any better. The 1500s brought with them the final nail in the coffin in the form of the dissolution of the monasteries. In order to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and marry Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII broke with the Roman Catholic Church and began disbanding the monasteries, priories, and convents in England, Wales, and Ireland, disposing of their assets and taking their riches. The buildings were sold off to his favourites, repurposed, and eventually fell into ruin. Any abbots or monks who refused to surrender were executed, with the rest being given pensions and left homeless. Revo survived until 15. 38. It was dissolved on the 3rd of December 1538 and this marked the end of life, monastic life at Revo. The buildings were dismantled and they were, well the land was sold to um, the Earl of Rutland, um, his name was Sir Thomas Manners um, and he was able to do whatever he wanted with the buildings. Rutland was obviously trying to get as much out of the monastery as possible, so much so that he would remove the lead from the windows and he would have that melted down. So he is trying to get as much money out of it as possible. We can also see the destruction of the abbey and making it unusable for the monks through the archaeology of the chapter house. The workmen actually chipped into the piers, so the, the uprights that would have been holding up the roof. and they used ropes to pull those piers down. Interestingly, when the site was excavated 
there was a body found underneath one of these piers. So one of the workmen did unfortunately meet his rather grisly end um, during the destruction of the abbey. If it hadn't been for the dissolution, if Revo had survived, um, it's a, actually a bit unpredictable what it would have ended up looking like. If Revo had continued to be very wealthy, it could well have been completely rebuilt. If the Reformation hadn't happened in England, it's quite possible that um, England would have shared in the Baroque architecture that's such a feature of Italy and um, southern Germany and so on. We might see something quite Roman looking or possibly even something like one of the great Baroque churches of Bavaria or Austria in, uh, in Riva. It's perfectly possible. It's really difficult to speculate what would have happened to the Abbey had there not been the dissolution of the monasteries and the Reformation. In my own opinion, I think that there would have been a Reformation no matter what. Would the Abbey have been destroyed like it was? It's highly likely that there would have been some destruction. Historians will have different opinions no matter what. In my opinion, Revo probably would have still met its end. For Revo, post-dissolution life gave the Abbey a new job as an ironworks. Pre-dissolution, the Abbey had a highly advanced prototype blast furnace that was used to make things like nails, tools and cutlery. Evidence suggests that if this blast furnace hadn't been abandoned in the dissolution, the highly advanced technology could have brought us into the Industrial Revolution two and a half centuries earlier. Revo had always been um, a site of industry. We know that from the 12th century there were ironworks and they did really, really well to uh, make money out of this. And by the 16th century, these furnaces were almost equivalent to our modern blast furnace. So Manners, when he took over the monastic site, he realised that this industrial technology uh, would actually make him more money. So he started investing further into the ironworks at Revo. And by the 1570s, it was making more money for him than the, the renting out of the land. Once the supply of timber and charcoal were exhausted, the now ruined Revo took on a new role when it was sold to Sir Charles Duncombe, a London banker. By the mid 18th century, the way that society is using these ruins has changed drastically. They've become romantic. They are now part of the picturesque era. So in 1758, the Duncombs decide to build a terrace um, overlooking Revo Abbey itself. So their focus isn't necessarily on the, the abbey ruins and the history of them. It's looking at them as a viewpoint and looking at them as a romantic view across the valley. They used the promenade and they used the tree line in a really interesting early picturesque manner and that was in the way that they framed the abbey. They didn't have a clear view of the abbey all the way along. They used the tree line to highlight different parts of the abbey. William Wordsworth visited the terrace. He also actually visited the abbey itself on his honeymoon. So we've got lots of people now starting to use the terrace and the abbey grounds in a very different way. I also spoke to history graduate and teacher Bella Gatton about this movement. So, the perception of the Abbey changed from the 1800s to the 1900s. There are movements in the 19th century like aestheticism, which were about being beautiful rather than serving a purpose. Pioneers of this being Oscar Wilde and William Morris, and this heavily influenced how people viewed the Abbey. So, medievalism also came around the 18th century along with romanticism. So you can see how people at this time would have 
view the Abbey as incredibly romantic and would have wanted to have visited it for this reason. As we begin to approach the modern day, Rivo begins to be appreciated not just for its beauty and romanticism, but also for its architecture. So, as we reach the 1900s, around 1920, there were huge repairs to the Abbey. The 19th century brought a fresh understanding of architecture and a more scholarly view of ruins. Rivo had huge architectural importance, so there was state intervention in an around 1917, and reinforced concrete beams were hidden in the upper walls. Um, around 90,000 tonnes of debris was shifted, and much of this work was undertaken by veterans of the First World War. For many of these veterans, the preservation of the Abbey was their life work. One example of this is Bob Cornforth, who, after the war, was employed at Revo as a labourer. He spent most of his adult life working at Revo and also at nearby Byland Abbey, and was awarded a Civil Service Medal for his commitment to the preservation of these sites. Today, the Abbey is one of the most popular ecclesiastical ruins in the country, attracting thousands of visitors each year and captivating the imaginations of all. As beautiful as the ruins are, we can't forget the 889 years of history that have shaped not only the ruins we see today, but the country itself. We can learn a lot as a society through the figures in Rivo's history, and the ruins remain as a beautiful reminder of these lessons.